consistency is the most important thing because if you want to build up an audience they need to know that you're going to be releasing three times a week seven days a week whatever your schedule is but you have to make sure that you're delivering consistently for the audience most hosts never achieve the results they hoped for they're falling short on listenership and monetization meaning their message isn't being heard and their show ends up costing them money This podcast was created to help you grow your listenership and make money while you're at it. Get ready to take notes. Here's your host, Adam Adams. What's up, podcaster? It's your host, Adam Adams. And today I am joined with someone across the pond, Mark Hayward. You will notice his accent in a sec. And with that being said, we will talk about him rebranding his show, some of his experience with his show, and the thing that he does to help grow his own podcast and grow other people's podcasts. So if you're thinking about, hey, I might rebrand my show, boom, you got to listen to this episode. If you're thinking about how do I get my brand out in front of more people, it's really getting on other people's podcasts, and we'll tell you how you do that here on this episode. Let's dive in. Mark, when did you start your podcast, Business Growth Talks? And was it your first ever podcast, or is, did you do a different one? No, this is the first podcast that I've done and the only podcast I've ever done. I started nearly six years ago. I think I've done 300, no, 436 episodes. 439 as of today. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. Thank you for the correction. (laughs) Awesome. Um, So I started it a long time ago and it was a very much a hobby experience for me. I was still working in corporate at the time. And the reason why I did it was... I started doing a lot more presentations and sort of talks to people in my industry and with clients. And I was agonizing over how to present it and what I wanted to say and and where I was doing my job. And then I was like spending two hours after work, just working out how to present myself and how to talk about it. It all sounds very cliched, but it was in essence trying to find my voice. I wanted to work out how to do it. So at the start, I chose sort of a subject within business. The show was previously called Absolute Business Mindset. And it was all about talking about things that were going on in business, things that my experiences that I'd had. And there were only 10, 15 minute episodes. And it was just basically being able to consume information and then be able to present it. So it was the only podcast I've ever done. And I started as a very much as a sort of hobby to just develop my skill set on being able to present. Now, fast forward maybe 18 months, I started doing interview. And now I'm not even sure how many people I've interviewed. I'm probably over 200 people I've interviewed within business and entrepreneurship. And it really was, it's evolved and grown into something that I'm so proud of. And it's something that I have great guests. We had you on, Adam, not so long ago. We'll be releasing that in a couple of weeks. And- well, then that means your guests aren't that good, really, if you had me. <laughs> all right keep no, going keep you going i'm awesome. sorry <laughs> you were awesome you gave such a different perspective on the health side of running a business as well and that was super interesting so check that episode out if you're looking to learn more about adam and it's just evolved and sort of into this show that now has an audience has a loyal audience and we're growing really really nicely and we can talk about the rebranding and the reasons why i rebranded but essentially i wanted to just start something to get my presentation skills getting better. So it was called Absolute Business Mindset before? Yeah. And you started to develop like how to present to an audience a little bit better. Yeah. And let's just find out why and when the rebrand. The big thing is the why, and then later we'll go to how, but why and when this rebrand? So I've been part of a podcast mastermind for two years, maybe 18 months, two years. And when I was talking to guys who were much further down the pathway than I, when it comes to reputation and downloads, were saying that to be able to be successful in podcasting, you have to niche or niche down into an area. And I rather naively said, no, 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 I don't need to do that. I enjoy having a vast variety of different industry people from different industries asking different things. And they were like, okay. If it works for you, that's absolutely fine. So I I was told a long time that I needed to niche down. And so I went through like a sort of thought process of like, do I want to try and get more of a niche to be able to grow the audience? Or is the purpose of my podcast to be able to speak to really interesting people talking about their journey? And actually the co-founder of my booking agency was a guest on my show. 
and we just stayed in contact and then started this business about two and a bit years ago. So I was really happy with the way things were going, although the numbers, the downloads were not massive. I had a loyal listening and I enjoyed the experience. But it came through earlier this year. I was suddenly thinking, look, I've got this loyal listenership, but if I thought about niching down into a different area within business, I always wanted to have a business show. That was always my ambition. Would I get more from it as an entrepreneur? Would I be able to focus my guests on that area and maybe get known as the go-to person about growing businesses? And what I enjoyed about the Journey podcast show, The Absolute Business Mindset, was I enjoyed listening to hearing people, how they got from their starting point to their end point. And there's still aspects of that in my show now. But I thought that I would try all this advice I've been given by sages and gurus in podcasting, that maybe I should think about niching down into that area. So I worked on it and thought about it and listened to loads of shows within business. And one of the things that really fascinated me was actually that stage from not startup, not like a corporate, but that growing and scaling and systemizing and process driving the business really fascinated me. And I thought, actually, whether a guest that's done it and they can talk about how they grew their business or whether I get an entrepreneur that is growing their business and what strategies they're doing to be able to grow their business. I thought this is something that I'm still going to feel passionate about after another 439 episodes. And I thought, you know what? I should listen to the advice I'm given is an area that I'm passionate about, an area that I love talking to people about. And so the rebrand was earlier this month, 2nd of October. And now we've got regular shows being released about growing, scaling, building businesses. I'm thinking through that. And how many businesses do you have? Do you just have two? So I have a podcast booking agency. I have real estate that I own and rent out. Some of them are Airbnbs. Some of them are buy to lets. And then I've got a whole, what you guys call a wholesale business where I source deals for investors as well. Okay. And you help people scale a business? Like you have another business where you just maybe consult with people? I haven't done that as yet. That's not something that necessarily I've got the time to do at the moment. I went into Airbnb in properties earlier this year, and it's been hugely successful. So I'm actually working with an investor now on actually building that business out of an Airbnb business as well as the buy to lets, which I still love. And they're very, very valuable to me and very, very close to my heart. So I'm not massively keen on necessarily at the moment to be a consultant for people, how to grow businesses. I just want to throw myself into the podcast where we can help our listeners who are entrepreneurs, business owners that are looking to grow their business, even if they are seeds like startups and that they're wanting how to how to grow that business it's hopefully for the listeners is going to grab really great insight really great hints tips ways that worked perhaps failures that didn't go so well as well they're great for shows as well and so not a consultant at the moment might be something further down the line if your podcast is about business growth it's called business growth talks and to the listener mark hayward's bio is in the show notes and also the link to his podcast and and his company that helps you get booked on other podcasts. All that stuff's down in the show notes. So you can scroll down and connect with him there. Mark, if you don't do consulting for business growth specifically, why did you want to niche into that area? It's just something you're passionate about or do you get value from the podcast by having the conversations with a guest? A little bit of both. It's an area like I've worked in corporate. I worked in established businesses. I understood what processes, systems, specializations in areas. And I've sort of seen it from that side. Equally, I've done the solopreneur stuff. I've done businesses that I'm growing now. And so I just loved the idea of, and I don't think it's been serviced that well with other shows. Um, There's other great shows in the same area. But I don't think it's being covered with enough detail and there's enough shows about it. So for me, it was an area which I thought I could do another 400 shows on, which was super important for me because I have to train people how to start podcasts and the number of people do 10 episodes. I think that one of my best students 
got to about 60 70 episodes but just ran out of time effort they couldn't prioritize it they couldn't be consistent enough and so i wanted to make sure it was an area that i was hugely passionate about and where i could add value and help the people that are looking to grow businesses so it was a mixture of passion as well as sort of being in an area which i thought was undersupplied with enough shows got it cool i want to ask you how you're scaling the airbnb business if you don't mind you said it's being hugely successful. It's something that you're putting a lot of time in. And I think that that's one of the reasons why you're not consulting right now is because you got yeah. that going on. Yeah. And I have a little bit different experience than you, Mark. I grew up only having my own businesses. Okay. I did bartend when I was in college and stuff like that. Yeah. However, as far as my work experience, I have never worked in a corporate environment. Mm -hmm. And actually, my mom is helping me out with my business because she worked in a corporate environment and she knew a lot about scaling and systemizing and putting in yep. the implementing processes. And it's been pretty helpful so far. We're in the beginning stages, but it's really cool that she's supporting because these are some things that I don't know what I'm doing on. So mm -hmm. I think we've got a couple listeners. We've got a listener today who came from corporate and they already know this stuff. They already understand this stuff. They probably get it that, hey, that big business did its thing and, and it was successful. It had hundreds of employees because it did these things. So I'm going to do them too. And it's just mm -hmm. second nature, like it yeah. is for you and like it is for my mom. But then there's my other listener who's a little bit more like me. They never worked for somebody. They don't know what corporate looks like. They wouldn't be able to work for somebody. So they probably didn't see all those systems and processes. Right. With that in mind, I'm hoping that the listener can get out of the next few minutes of our conversation if they're more like me and they just, they're like, yeah, systems, that sounds really good. I want it, but how? Where do I start? Where do you start? Right. So the place that you often need to start is when you're working with teams and working with people in teams and you're sort of like sort of five, 10 employees. At that stage of a business, there's lots of sort of crossover. There's lots of generalizations and people do a little bit of marketing, a little bit of sales, a little bit of finance and sort of these core operations and management. These are the sort of components of a corporate environment, a corporate company. But when you're doing that as a startup and there's like three or four of you, you're just sort of mucking in and just getting it done to be able to be successful. But what I love about being able to systemize things is when you start thinking about components of the business, so for example, um, the finance, so you have to track and measure and sort of work out where your expenses are, what your costs are, what your income is and how profitable it is, your lead acquisitions and things like all these things. If you're able to designate roles to people, even in smaller businesses, give them responsibility for certain things that often elevates people because people feel that they've got things that they are responsible for. And as a delegate, when you're delegating, all you really want to do is empower your people to be the best that they can to serve the business and be able to make the business profitable and successful. So what we were able to do in our business, in our booking agency, and what you get the other end with mature corporates is there's designated roles for people that need to be done. So we've got responsibilities for people with finance. We've got operations. We've got the people that are actually doing the account management side. And then we've got people working in marketing and sales that are doing that. And so when you're able to create... Let me pause you just for a second and we get right back to where we are. How big is the Airbnb team? How big is the podcast booking agency? Right. Absolutely. So the Airbnb business team, there are two investors at the moment and we have a management team. So okay. there's me. Uh, so because we're investing in London, that's my area of expertise, my area of specialism. So it is a small business that we're looking to be able to build up the Airbnbs. We're now going on on a heavy investment because property prices in London anyway have reduced. But the interesting bit about the Airbnb business, I've got Airbnbs that I own that I've turned into Airbnb. Be. But something that we're exploring and, and we've just signed some contracts with people is what we call rent to service accommodation. So the landlord still owns the flat, the apartment, but we in a contract take ownership, take control of that property and then turn it into 
services accommodation. So it could be Airbnb, Booking.com, all the other sort of platforms. So that's something that we are really trying to leverage at the moment because we see that. So we pay a guaranteed rent to the landlord, which is agreed in a contract. And then in the contract, it says that we're going to turn that property into an Airbnb. So what you then do, there's things you have to do with furnishing. So you have to make it in a hotel style. So there is an upfront cost and an investment into furnishing the property. But you get a 12 month contract, sometimes it's a 24 month contract that you then take control of that. And then you pay the guaranteed rent and you take the profit on top of that. So for us, for that business, and when I was <clears throat> looking to do that with for my own properties, I was so diligent to get an exceptional management team because I didn't want to be running the advertising, the marketing, the plumbers, if there's problems, the maintenance guys, the cleaners, the laundry, making sure the sheets are there. So for me, outsourcing that to a really good management company, and they are actually a very competitive price as well for the owner as well, was super important. So so for us, it, it was able, like, I want to own the property and take the profit from the property, but devolve, sort of delegate to this really good management company. And I went through and I say interviewed, I talked to a lot of different companies of what the services that they provide. And I got to a super exceptional management company. And that then makes my investment a lot more smooth and a lot more because they're actually the experts on doing this. They service all over um all over england and focus on london and southeast and london and so for me it was getting the right people in place and whenever you're looking to create a business it's super important to get the right people for the right roles and for me that was super important all right and how about the other business so the booking agency, so there's me and the co-founder, George, he does a lot of the sales stuff. I've been sort of helping out with sales recently because he was ill for a little while. We also have another salesperson that is contracted to us who's on a commission-based basis, and he's going out there and he's selling our services. We have two account managers. I, I'm account manager for some of them. I've got another person that helps me on the account management side, and we've got another person that's dealing mainly with the clients, and the account manager deals with the clients as well. And then we've got people to fill in spaces like the finance. We've got people that are doing the work behind the scenes to be able to make sure that we're tracking lead acquisition costs. We've got KPIs and things like that that are all embedded into the business as well. So how big is the team though? Like With like a number? Less than 10. Okay. Got it. Got it. And if it becomes like some giant business, is, is that your goal? What's the goal with, I guess, with both companies? So for the booking agency, we are actually spending a lot of effort in Google ads at the moment, and that is proving hugely successful for generating leads. And the lead quality that we are getting from them has been really, really successful. And so we're looking to grow this business. We want more people to do the outreach. They will be VAs and various uh, people that will be doing the outreach and the support. We are looking for more account managers to be able to help me. And then the sales people will will build up the sales team. And the aim is both what me is and that? George. Sorry? What is that? AMEs? AMEs. Maybe it's an accent issue. Sorry. I'm not so, sure what so you we said. Have, we have yeah. VAs and we've got, so they're virtual assistants that are mm -hmm. helping us. We've got account managers and we've got people that are helping on the account side. And then we've got sales people that are building up. So using- Is Google that Ad what an AME is? Is it like account manager executive or something? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I wasn't sure. Okay. All right. Fine. Cool. Quick question. Let's move into like your experience, pros and cons, and then we'll take a quick break and we'll get back into like booking and how to get on more podcasts and why cool. is that good for another podcaster. So as far as with your podcast, what mistakes have you made and what have you learned from- Hosting a podcast, 439 episodes so far. So many mistakes, so many failures. I think taking it more seriously and trying to run it more as something that is a marketing strategy for me and my businesses was something which I didn't understand when I started and when I was growing the audience. So I think sort of 
in a way at the early stages not taking it seriously and then when i started seeing growth and doing interviews not necessarily spending enough time on growing that audience i was probably a little bit slow to be able to really think about it as a major component as a host as a guest you're positioning yourself as a thought leader as a personal brand or your product or service that you're selling or book but equally from a podcasting host point of view you really need to consistently deliver and and i think i've been over the years hugely consistent on delivering content for my audience so i think that for me was when i'm talking to people about starting a podcast and they're sort of asking me questions consistency is the most important thing because if you want to build up an audience they need to know that you're going to be releasing once a week, twice a week, three times a week, seven days a week, whatever your schedule is. But you have to make sure that you're delivering that consistently for the audience or the audience will lose interest and go on to something else, something more educational, something more entertaining, whatever it is. And I think that's the other thing that I've thought about is making the show, yes, educational, I do want to help business owners, but it has to be entertaining as well. It has to have an element of sort of getting to understand the person that you've got on the show. So I think it was more sort of taking it seriously and sort of trying to leverage it as a thought leader, as a person in business, which I didn't really think about early on in the days. So let me make sure I understand just the last part of what you said, because I am taking the best notes that I can. I think you said a podcast needs to be, please correct me if I'm wrong. This is what I want to double check. It needs to be educational and it needs to be entertaining at the same time. Is that yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Perfect. And I agree with you on all of these points. So as far as some of the mistakes, you didn't take it as seriously in the beginning. You didn't focus on the marketing, adding fuel to the tank, if you will. Yeah. Your vehicle's not going to get anywhere without the fuel. So in the beginning, you weren't really taking it seriously. You weren't really focused on how do we get in front of the more people. And you ended up changing that. How did you change it? So it was a complete rebrand. So it moved from Absolute Business Mindset, which was the journey show, understanding where people started to where they are now. And moving it very much thinking about things like how to grow a business, uh, talent acquisition and talent retention, finances, budgets, market expansion, really trying to think about those components of a business to be able to grow and systemize and process it. So I thought about the logo, redesigned the logo, changed the music, changed the style. I added in a reflections point at the end of the show as well. It might be two to five minutes Like after I finish the show, stop the recording, and then I go straight into a reflection point. And these all these things that I saw from other shows, I did deep research on the shows that I liked. What did they have? What were the components which I enjoyed and what components did I want to be able to evolve into my show? So it was super important to spend that time researching on, like, I enjoy it things like the diary of a ceo um, i enjoy tim ferris and all those sort of big shows but the smaller shows that like i've got a friend of mine called henry lopez who's got a small business show the how of business and i super enjoyed his show and i was like actually when i'm trying to think about moving from a journey show which is quite generic and i think my show got lost in lots of shows doing something similar and I thought I saw his show and I've got another friend who's doing an AI show and a media show. And I just thought, look, what they're doing is they're trying to tap into that audience, that narrower audience, but getting everyone within that narrow audience rather than spreading your sort of your breadth, your net so wide that you're only picking off some people along the way. So I thought to myself, look, I'm going to own this space. And this is what I'm looking to do in this year and next year, end of this year and into 2024, is really get myself in my lane and really work about building up that and being that go-to podcast that people go, well, if I want to grow a business, I need to listen to this show. Mm. Good stuff. I'm going to ask you on the frequency of the episodes. When you were originally telling me about any mistakes and things that you'd learned, what I first really heard was like, 
you know, I wasn't taking it seriously. I wasn't doing the marketing. I didn't spend enough time growing the audience. You need to consistently deliver. I was always consistently delivering. That's the most important thing, especially if somebody's just starting a podcast. So yep. This brings me to a question that might be the last question on this part of the topic. And it's just asking about the frequency of the episodes. Because you mentioned that you are already consistent and you mentioned that consistency is important. When you were talking about the rebrand, you talked about the name, the content, the logo, the music, the intro, and the reflections point. You never mentioned anything about the frequency, how often you're publishing. So, I'm, But I'm curious, how many times did you start publishing per week? How In the middle, how many were you publishing per week? And now after the rebrand, how many episodes are you publishing in one week? Right. So when I was still working in my corporate role, I was probably doing three or four episodes a week. Hold on. Okay, but Hold no, on. But I need to write this down. When no, seriously. I was doing corporate, yeah. I was probably doing do what did you say? Three to four? Three episodes. I think I was doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay. Three episodes. Not three to four, but three. Yeah, three. And that's interesting because there's a lot of people that listen to this show. Someone listening right now is like Oh, I'm so busy. I mean, I don't think I could do an episode every week. I'm maybe once a month, uh, maybe every other week, but an episode every week, that sounds crazy. Oh, and now, now oh, here's Mark hard. Hayward being like, yeah, I, I just had a full-time job and I just did three a week consistently. Right. So I think it's inspirational. Transparency for it. Right? Okay. Keep going. I was probably doing 12 hours work every day. I was committed to my career in corporate world. But I was able to find a topic, find some detail that I wanted to talk about and release a 10 minute episode. OK, it wasn't particularly well produced. It wasn't particularly well edited. It was very raw and sort of honest, I suppose. But I would come home after those hours and I had very young children, but I would just come upstairs and just record something and then just post it. So, as I said, that, that I wasn't taking it seriously as an idea. After the evolution of things, when I was moving away from the corporate role, I was starting businesses and it was taking a lot more time and effort of myself, I suppose. I decided I would cut back to two episodes a week. And then I reduced to one episode a week because businesses needed to grow. It needed to have a lot more concentration. And equally... I developed the show and the format that actually took up more time, more effort for me. So when I started going back to one show a week, which was just one interview, like I honestly, I spend an hour every guest researching them and trying to understand them, trying to build up a knowledge before I go on the show to really understand that person. So when I started taking it more seriously and did the research on the guests and then it was then doing the recording for an hour and then you then had to do the editing, the post-production. I do have people that do help me, but predominantly I'm still majority of the stuff I'm doing myself. So I got to one episode a week on Absolute Business Mindset before it changed and I was kind of happy with the way things were going. Now, what I've done with Business Growth Talks is I've gone back to two episodes a week. So it's a Monday sort of lunchtime UK time. So I release it'll be the start of the US day. And then on a Thursday, I'm looking to target things that are a little bit more trending in the business or wider society. So I've done some episodes on what are the five components of growing a business. But equally, I'm interested to see, because I'm duly running a YouTube video service as well. I'm doing the show on YouTube as well. When I started researching and talking to people about YouTube, they were like, look, YouTube is the second biggest search engine after Google. So a lot of the content on YouTube, and this is what I'm experimenting with at the moment with the new show. So on a Thursday, I'm looking at topics which are a little bit more current or trending in that last week, primarily to see the difference of the download or the watches on YouTube versus the listens on the podcast. And I'm interested to sort of see, I've got my core audience that enjoy the interview style, but is a more trending topic, does it work better for YouTube and or does it work better for the podcast as well? So last week, 
I just watched the documentary on David Beckham. And obviously he's a huge, big brand. And I prioritized the brand inside of David Beckham. But I went, I'm going to chase the search engine and be able to see what I can do with with that. So that's actually got more watches on YouTube than it ever has on probably any of my other shows. So I am now committed to twice a week, one interview on a Monday, and then more of a trending topic on a Thursday. And out of curiosity, when you say you're doing YouTube and podcast, can you say which one's better or which one does better for different reasons? So podcasting does better. Podcast does better, but you still do the YouTube because YouTube does some other parts of it better? Yeah. So actually, I listened to my friend show, The New Media Show, and they had a lady from Tom Bilyeu's Impact Theory. And she was saying that, and this was one of the mistakes I did was, although it doesn't need to be hugely different, it does need to be different on how you market and how the bits that you're talking on each show, whether it's a YouTube channel or podcast. So something that I've introduced with the new show is that when I'm saying, please do subscribe to my podcast on all podcast platforms, that's going in the podcast show, but that's been taken out of the YouTube show. When I talk about it, likes and subscribe, descriptions that's on the youtube channel that's not on the podcast very minor tweaks like that seem to be producing better results both on the podcast and on on the youtube channel as well so do you cover some things twice and so that you can have it different in different each place or okay so so i'm now so i will edit out the bits that i talk when i'm doing the podcast i'll edit out the sort of bits that are aimed for podcasters and not aimed for YouTube YouTubers. So it's an interesting dynamic. I think it makes sense. That's the brilliance of podcasting. Sometimes you just need to hear someone who's been there, done it, or is doing it. Actually, I could make that tweak pretty easily and could have pretty big impact on the listens and the watches. Mark, quick question. Do you think a way to grow a podcast is to be featured on other people's podcasts? Yes or no? Yes. In a second, we'll be right back and we'll talk about how to do that. Hey, my friend, as you know, this episode is sponsored by my company, growyourshow.com. We want you to be able to have the best tools at your disposal without costing you a whole arm and a leg. So right now you can get a free list of vetted equipment that like mics, mixers, webcams, sound treatment, editing software, everything that you need. I created the whole PDF with direct purchase links just to save you time and money to help it be more convenient for you. So this free PDF will help you skip all the guesswork. If it's on there, it's vetted and approved by yours truly. And if it's not on there, it's probably not worth the money. So go ahead and get yours at growyourshow.com forward slash PDF. Let's get back into the show. And we're back with Mark Hayward. And we are talking about all things podcasting. And we want to get into how to get booked on other people's shows so that you can grow your business. In a minute, you'll probably learn that getting booked on other people's shows is one of the best ways for you to grow your audience on your podcast. We've talked about rebranding a show. We've talked about Mark's experience in his show. We've talked about growing a business and scaling a business and things that need to be in place. Talked about niching, so many other things. Whenever you're scaling, it's really the people that are in the right role and made me think of a book called Who Not How. We will link to who, not how in the show notes for you with affiliate links. So we can make a couple of pennies, of course, but we'll talk about who, not how, because Mark mentioned that you need to get the right butts in the right seats. You need to get the right people in the right role. And some of the mistakes that he made on his podcast, which you should not make, which is you need to take it seriously. He didn't. You need to be doing marketing. You need to have a strategy for marketing. He didn't. You need to spend enough time figuring out how to grow the audience. He didn't for a long, long time. And then he realized that he needed to do it. And in doing so, a rebrand was in order. He talked to his mastermind group. His mastermind group said, you've got to niche down. And he argued. He was like, nope, I'm not going to niche down. This is the right way for me. And it came back to haunt him. And he said, okay, I'm changing the name. I'm changing the content. I'm changing the logo. I'm changing the music. I'm changing the intro. And I'm adding a reflections point because that's what I think is going to be interesting. We also talked about how he started with three episodes per week. 
gone to two, went to one, and now he's back up to two episodes a week on Mondays, always doing an interview on Thursdays, always figuring out a trending topic, how he puts it on YouTube and podcasts, but he's intentional to make sure that he's playing to the player. Meaning on YouTube, he does YouTube things. On podcast, he does podcast things. He edits out the wrong things from the wrong place because he wants to play to the player. So let's talk about podcast introduction. Let's talk about getting you on other people's shows. Mark, why would I want to be on anyone else's show? The brilliance of being a guest on other people's show is, as a podcast host, you create your own audience around that. So you have fans and followers and people that are following you. As a guest, before you've gone on any shows, you've got your people, whether it's a LinkedIn community, Facebook, or YouTube community, and they are all interested in what you're doing. But being a guest on shows means that you're able to hack into the other person, the host's audience, and you get to a wider audience that you some people you would never normally be able to connect with. So as a business owner, entrepreneur, as an author or a podcaster, this is a really good marketing strategy to be able to reach audiences that you normally wouldn't get out to. As a business owner? A podcaster, what were the other things? Or Author, or entrepreneur, or an entrepreneur. You need to get in front of more people. Absolutely. And if you've got a podcast, I think it makes a lot of sense for you to be on somebody else's podcast within your niche. The great thing about as a podcaster working with other podcasters and being a guest on their show is that you can connect with them. So you've been on my show. I've come on your show. That's been sort of mutual that we've been able to work together. What the brilliant thing you can sometimes do at a later stage is you could do a dual show. So someone I did an experiment with um, a little while ago, we did a show together and sort of just riffed off each other and talked about podcasting, talked about businesses, talked about things that were important to us in life and family and things like that. So being a guest is so, so beneficial for podcasters because there's so many different ways that you can leverage this. You might end up setting up a course with a business partner that was a podcast host that you were on. That's what George and I did. My business partner was on my show. We then stayed in contact and we set up this business. Equally, being on podcasts, other people's podcasts, we talk about the Google effect. So when people do a search for you, if you're a podcaster, yes, your podcast will be on. Yes, your social media platform of preference will be at the top. But equally, you will have a list of other shows that you've been on where you can share your experience, your expertise, your knowledge, and be able to give that to the people that are searching for you. So it's so beneficial in so many different ways. And some of them are very nuanced and very sort of subtle, but that sort of Google effect of people researching you and seeing what your, your other content that you're providing can be so valuable uh, for a podcaster or, or an entrepreneur. Couple questions. Mark, you are I'm going to rely on you as the expert here. What I'm curious about is are do we need a podcast booking platform? Okay. The first, do we need one? Because couldn't I just go and meet people on my own? Couldn't I just have my virtual assistant do it? So do we need one? Cuz sometimes it's expensive. There's companies out there that charge 300-ish per time that you're on someone's show. There's companies out there who charge 500-ish per time that you're on somebody's show. So we can imagine, like, I'm just going to get on 10 shows. It might be $5,000. Why don't I just have my VA do it? Why don't I just do it myself? So do we need a podcast booking agent? Secondarily, are podcast booking agents created equally? And what sets yours apart? So what I think is important to understand is that we do a full turnkey solution so that you have a kickoff call with me. You then have a matching service where we can rank you. We have a directory of all the podcasts globally, any podcast in any country we can find. And we put you work out what your ranking should be. We create a media kit for you, which is our pitching document to podcasters. You then have, which is different with our business, with other people's, you have touch points with your account manager. And that means that after every six, seven, eight episodes, you have 30 minutes with your account manager and you can just sort of 
to like talk about what's going well, what isn't going well. Is there things you want to change? Is there niches that you want to prioritize and maybe do it in a slightly different order? We do all the outreach. We do all of the hard work, reaching out to podcasts, um, getting yeses, getting noes. All you get as a as a client of ours is a is a Calendly or an equivalent link, which you then go in and book the time for the show with them. And that is the only impact that you, uh, actually you need to do. Now, best practice, what we tell our clients is you should listen to an episode or two before you go on someone's show to get an idea. Is it a journey podcast? Is it a, a wider? Is it a focused on a niche? Is it focused on a theme? It's what type of show are you actually going on to? So we best practice is we say, listen to an episode or two, but that is all you need to do. And you can then just shine as a thought leader, as a podcaster, talking about your show and really be able to convince people as a podcaster that they should come over from that show that you're on onto your show and they will get value from your show. So to summarize, we do everything for you. Yes. It is, it, it is more expensive than potentially getting a VA to do it. But we have this directory with every podcast in the world. And that's what people that do a DIY service, do it yourself service. They go on Apple podcasts and they look at the top shows and they might find an email address. They might find a contact point and your VA might send a speculative email. But with us, we've got a media kit already for you in certain industries, certain niches. We have relationships already with clients that have already been on shows. So it is so important for you to use your time effectively and be able to prioritize getting on people's shows and doing that as easily as you can by using a booking service like ours. So if we work with your company, we get interviewed by you. We find out what we're ranking. And in a second, I want to ask you what that even means. What do you mean by what we're ranking? Ranking okay. in what way? So we'll get back there. You'll build us a media kit. You'll start booking. We'll be connected with our account manager to be able to make changes along the way. You'll do all the outreach. You'll do all the hard work. We'll have a Calendly. You share with us best practices so that we could listen to an episode or two. It helps us to be able to shine and become the expert on that other show. And then we have a call to action, which I'm about to ask you a question on that as well. So two questions. Yep. First, what do you mean by ranking? Okay. So ranking is very simply a score between zero and a hundred. Joe Rogan, I think is 98. So he is a million plus download show. And that is in the top 1% of podcasters. So people like Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan are all in that sort of high 90s. Your Joe Bloggs, who runs a show with five listens, is going to be down towards two or three. So, or so Mark, when you say we find out your ranking, that means your client is a podcaster who's getting on other po people's podcasts. It's a tongue twister. Your client is a podcaster who's getting on other people's podcasts, OPP, get down with OPP, other people's right. podcasts, and you're figuring out where their podcast ranks. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay, cool. Yeah. Now, second question, call to action. Yeah. And I heard you say, correct me if I'm wrong, you're on this other person's podcast, you're shining, you're being an expert, and you're telling them to come listen to your show. But that, I think, scares some people listening right now. I think they think you're wrong. I think they're thinking, no, 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 no. I need to do a lead magnet. No, 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 no. I got to get them to my website. No, I got to get into my free book. I got to get them into my email list. So what's the right call to action when I'm on somebody else's podcast? So this is the secret source. This is the information that we give once people have had their kickoff meeting. But I'm going to share with you today, Adam, because I think it's fair for your audience to understand this. If we're working with entrepreneurs and business owners that want to sell a product or service, or if it's a podcaster that wants to be able to generate revenue, maybe it's through consulting or through advertising, through an email marketing, we always, always suggest you have that call to action at the end of the show. And that call to action could be a number of different things. It could be go to a landing page that then you then have so what we say is to use a basic funnel your podcast free people go there they listen to it they love the show that you're on funnel them to a landing page a website where they can download something 
that is of value to the audience that's free also. So once they've listened to the show, resonated with you, they go to a landing page. They then get a free download. It doesn't have to be anything too, too elaborate, but just something where they can see additional value. And then they are more likely to be able to reach out to you. Equally, if you do it right, you're collecting information about that audience, that, that, that audience member as well. So you might be collecting email, you might be collecting telephone numbers, you might be understanding where these and, and what we talk to our people is that God say, try and measure it, try and work out, get a landing page specifically for podcasting. Or if you're going onto your website, give a code that people use so you can track where you're getting the return on investment from. So that call to action, whatever the business you're in, is so important. And we would 100% encourage our clients to have something that gives additional value, which bridges them to that point, the bottom of the funnel, which is paid, whether that is a consulting, a coaching, a mentoring, whether it's uh, whatever that, that message is that you want to get them towards, you need to be able to funnel them through some steps. Okay. So at the top of the funnel, it's a landing page, website. It's a place to collect information. We give them value and it's a place to collect information like a phone number or an email. Yeah. We measure it. Yeah. And at the bottom of the funnel, it's coaching and mentoring or whatever that next thing. So a couple things. One, is it the right step to bring them to your podcast or to bring them to the funnel or both? It really depends on what your objective of being a guest okay. on the show. It makes sense. So if it is a coaching method, then funnel them through with an ebook or a, or a document and then get them to the coaching. If the objective is to get more listens for your podcast, then direct them to the podcast. Make it easy for them to direct them to the podcast. Okay. What's your call to action today, Mark? My call to action is please go to www.podcastintroduction.com. Have a look at the services. We've got all the features on there. We've got testimonials on there. Um, go and if you want to have a call, you can set up a call with our sales team and, and you, we can talk about how we can help you as a podcast guest. And equally, the show is called Business Growth Talks. It's on all podcast platforms and it's also on YouTube as well. Boom. We could drop the mic. If you're listening, go and check that out. All of these links are in the show notes. So if you didn't write that down on the podcast introduction or business growth talks, just scroll down, click the link. You'll be able to connect with Mark. The next episode that I have is going to be an interview episode. I want you to feel free to stick around the podcast. Don't go anywhere. I will see you there. Oh, hey, because three of my clients came to me recently looking to find a way to have their podcast make the money instead of cost them money. We put together a resource for some of our clients and I want to give it to you as well. It's something that did actually seem to help because one of them is now making $2,600 a month. Another one's $4,500 a month. And the third is making between $5,000 and $10,000 each month. And so it's been a resource that's been incredibly valuable to them. It's our sponsor sheet template. It's a template of a sponsor sheet, and it gives you something that you can hand to potential sponsors and hopefully also be making 2,600, 4,500, or between five and 10K regularly each month with your podcast. So this has been a contributing factor to helping all three of those clients turn their podcast into an additional income stream for them. And the way that you can find it is just going to our website, growyourshow.com, but put in forward slash templates, growyourshow.com forward slash templates. And then you can actually download that template and others that could be valuable to your podcasting experience. I'll see you on the next episode.